Hi there, I'm Lee Seaman, head of SCAD Film, and I'm so very glad to see so many people enjoying SCAD Gaming Fest 2021. So far, we've heard from game writers, game designers, game developers, and game innovators. And we've heard a lot about how the game industry is moving into other forms of entertainment and industries, and vice versa. Now we're going to talk about narrative design. And to do that, we'll be hearing from one of the most accomplished narrative designers in the country, Jolie Menzel. She's the lead narrative designer at The Coalition, and she happens to also be a SCAD alum. It's great to welcome Jolie back to SCAD. And after her presentation, there will be a Q&A moderated by SCAD Professor of Interactive Design and Game Development, Greg Johnson. So be sure to put your questions in the chat during the session. And now, without further delay, welcome Jolie. Hello. Oh. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction, Greg. Um, I'm Julie Menzel, the narrative designer at the Coalition. Uh, and today, I'd like to talk to everybody about the narrative designer's toolbox. Um, what does it take to get narrative into uh, a game? Specifically, with this presentation, we'll probably focus on AAA games. Uh, but I have experience in both AAA as well as indie, so we can dig into both in the Q&A, um, depending on what people are interested in hearing about. Uh, so first, just a little introduction. Um, again, I'm the narrative designer of the coalition. Um, I've just got there about a year ago, uh, about the time COVID started. So it's been a complete work from home uh, experience there so far. I've actually been in the industry for 10 years. Uh, and uh, I graduated from SCAD in 2012. I wrote the wrong date here. The program is correct. Uh, time doesn't matter anymore. Anyway, um, I'm a sequel major and I have a concept art and storyboarding minor. Uh, so some crossover with ITGM as well as the film department. Um, and my Twitter is Julie Menzel. Feel free to reach out there anytime. I love tweeting probably too much. Um, and here's some games I've worked on. So um, if you're familiar with any of these, uh, they're all very story-driven games. Uh, the first three, of course, are from Telltale, which is a studio famous for uh, their narrative experiences. Uh, and then after Telltale, I went to Ubisoft to work on The Fractured But Whole, which is um, actually a little more gameplay-driven, but uh, obviously had a very strong narrative component because we were trying to make a game that felt like a TV show. Uh, and then finally, I just recently shipped the uh, Gears 5 story DLC, Hive Busters, which is a, um, I like to call it a, a little episode. It's a, it's a short story uh, addition to Gears 5. Outside of the Gears 5 main story, it's a side story with a bunch of kind of a ragtag group of folks who are on a different mission from the main crew of, of Gears characters. So uh, it just came out la uh, late last year. It's very short and very fun. It's on Game Pass. Um, I hope you play it. Uh, so for this talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about what narrative design is, just defining it really quickly, and then we're going to dive into that design toolbox that we use at AAA Studios to tell story alongside gameplay. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about story as gameplay, which is more in the kind of telltale, double A, more indie model of games that we see coming out. Um, we also see some of those uh, mechanics in AAA games, maybe as a, a sub-mechanic. Um, I'll talk a little bit about other roles uh, that I work with uh, other folks on the team that I work with that are adjacent to narrative design that contribute to the story just as much as I do. Um, and then we'll recap and go to Q&A. So first, what is narrative design? Um, it's really about when you're a narrative designer, you own how the player interacts with your story, with the, with the game story. Game designers worry about how the player interacts with the mechanics of the game. Narrative designers are worried about the story specifically. And it's a lot more than just writing. I think there's a there's a big misconception, even in the industry, even now with professionals, that narrative design is just writing. Uh, it's a lot more than that. There's it is narrative design for a reason. There are many narrative needs uh, beyond just writing that a game team needs to move forward with their story. There's also a lot of design expertise that uh, we as narrative designers need to understand to be able to make the story work in a game. You know, there's still our systems and, and mission scripting that contribute to narrative ex being expressed in games. And it's our job to be versed in those design principles. So um, it really is, um, my boss likes to say, a jack or a jill of all trades uh, kind of kind of gig. Uh, we end up actually often being the glue 
between many other creative departments like level design, animation, cinematics. Um, we really, uh, narrative designers really serve to help keep all that stuff cohesive and keep the story moving um, together into, into one focused one focused goal. So let's dive right into it. Um, this is the narrative designer's toolbox. It's the common storytelling techniques in games. Uh, this is kind of a state of the state overview of games uh, as they exist right now. Um, this is kind of, you know, I'd say in the past five, five years, you know, the past couple generations, this, these have been the pretty standard tools that we use to um, get story into games or weave story around gameplay. Um, and actually I have this, uh, this section here specifically is story alongside gameplay. So this is, these are AAA games or really any game where story is giving context to game mechanics and they're deepening the player's connection to the characters in the world, but they're not the main way that the player is interacting with the story. The main way that the player interacts with the story or the game really is through their core mechanics. So in a first person shooter, that's obviously shooting stuff um, and more of an exploration game that might be picking things up, uh, exploring, like solving puzzles. Um, the idea here is basically that story is helping us supplement and give context to those game mechanics, but those game mechanics aren't necessarily asking the player to think about story. Um, it'll become clear with examples. So uh, let's dive into the examples. Um, really, uh, when you look at the AAA core tools, there's really just these five categories of things that we think about when we're picking how to tell a story uh, in a game. With the caveat that these terms vary from studio to studio, um, well, again, examples will be more useful here because you'll probably have another word for a lot of these things that um, maybe is different from the word I'm using here. But uh, the idea here is really thinking about um, all the different ways that you can understand, that you can express story. So before we get into what each of them is, uh, obviously there's choices to be made between these categories of tools um, as to why one tool might be right at that one time versus maybe um, another tool might be a better way to get your story across at another point in your game. And a lot of that has to do with agency. Uh, so agency as a whole, um, that's defined as an action or intervention, especially such as to produce a particular effect. So it's, and player agency therefore is the player's ability to do actions, to intervene with the game world um, it's the power that the player has on the game world. Uh, some games are very high agency in that they really let the player do anything. Uh, things like Minecraft come to mind. You know, you can build whatever you want, especially when you're in creative mode. Um, you really don't have a lot of reins on you. A low ag agency game might be described as something that uh, maybe like if you've ever been in a, if you ever played like a AAA game, and you had to walk down a very narrow corridor and you really couldn't do anything besides look forward, maybe shoot. Um, that would be a lower agency game because the actions you have, the options you have are more limited in that situation. And so when we look at agency, uh, it's kind of, uh, I guess, I don't want to say enemy, it's partner in crime, but uh, they often are conflicting, is attention. Uh, so especially on the story side, we need to make sure that when we are giving critical story elements to the player, uh, the player is actually paying attention to them. And it tends to be that when the player has more agency, more options, more things they can do, they tend to have less attention to the things that we are feeding them uh, versus when we keep them in those narrow corridors with those limited, um, those limited options, there is more attention. Um, on the thing in front of them, the thing that they are focusing on, and we can draw that focus. Uh, so generally, and I think a lot of you guys know this intuitively, uh, you know, cutscenes are a low agency uh, tool. They, you sit there and watch, it's the lowest agency possible thing. It's actually taking the interaction out of the interactive medium and having you watch it. Um, so that is the lowest agency uh, storytelling technique we have. Um, then below that we have our other techniques and we'll go into how they uh, work among various degrees of agency, um, but they are generally things that um, we can we can have, we can marry a bit better with gameplay. Um, and then also we tend to put different types of story in these different techniques based on that story points 
importance to the player to know. And again, I think examples <laughs> will help make this a lot more clear. So let's dive into it. Um, the first example I have, I'm actually going to go through both uh, cutscenes as well as what's called scripted dialogue. Scripted dialogue is when uh, a designer will hand place a dialogue uh, or a, a VO line, we call them a voiceover line, into a level, into a specific trigger, um, and really make sure it's playing at the exact right moment. Um, there's, it's, um, it's, it's some of the more in-engine work that uh, narrative designers get to do because it's usually done right alongside the level scripting. It's the same way you would place a trigger down in a level to open a door, you might place a trigger down in a level to have someone say their line when that happens. So let's get into it. Um, we can play video number one. Um, and just to note, I annotated the bottom right corner with the type of tool that's being used. It goes by a little fast, I apologize, but um, try to look there and just see what tool is being used at what moment in the video. All right, now we can go for real. <laughs> Promising start, eh? Beacon signal, though. Could be the others. We all got clear the comet. Hope they're out there. dig into what we saw there um, that opened obviously with a cutscene. Um, and thank you, I saw in the chat, people were praising it. I will definitely pass that along to our very hardworking cinematics team. <laughs> um, they've been with Gears for a very long time. And this is definitely one of, um, you know, some of our some of our most polished work. So um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, cutscenes. Uh, so there's actually two types of cutscenes in this uh, demo that we just watched. And from a player perspective, they might feel pretty much the same but from an implement, implementation perspective and actually even how we build them are very different. Uh, so this first one, uh, this is a cutscene, I'll call this standalone cutscene because this cutscene gets to exist in its own level. Everything in this, everything in this, what you're seeing right here was tailor-made for this cutscene, for these shots. Um, it's built based on, you know, storyboard style previs that we do for these, these sequences. Um, there's a high attention to acting details. Uh, we do a lot of performance capture and mo motion capture. That's, you know, motion captures the body, performance captures face dots. Um, we use both to make sure that the acting is the most high fidelity we can be. 
And the reason we do that is because, um, with this as an example, this is the first cutscene of High Busters. This is introducing these characters. Um, people have never seen, our, our player base has only seen these characters before in our multiplayer context. This is the first story that they're getting. So this is actually introducing our characters. Um, it's a, you know, I put here, it's used for critical story point. It's a pretty, it's a pretty critical story point to set your characters off on the right foot, introduce them to the player. Um, I should also note that the player before this actually could choose any of these three characters to play as. So you'll notice that this cutscene uh, showcased all three of them in a little bit of light so that, you know, no matter what, who you're playing as, you get to see your main character acting as part of the scene. Um, so yeah. And then we have the in-level cutscene. So you notice there, there was a fade to black there between the two, if, if anyone caught that. Um, but that was us actually loading in the level. And so similar to our other cutscene, uh, super high attention to detail. Some, um, I believe this actually is mo-capped. Uh, someone probably had to like fake that they were hanging off of the thing in our studio and we captured that. <laughs> um, the, but the sets are shared with gameplay. So there's a lot of coordination between the level designers, the level artists and the cinematics team to make sure that there's space for this stuff. Um, uh, in the other end, when we do those, um, when we put that acting that we capture into the scene, we also need to make sure that acting smoothly transitions into gameplay. And so when we go into the systemically driven gameplay idols, like standing there, walking around, um, those transitions need to be smooth and gradually let the player in. Uh, why do we do that? Well, basically, um, again, critical story points. Uh, this is another place we can assure that there is attention the player is paying to the dialogue and the and anything we want to get across to them uh, without them having agency over their controller to move around. Um, the bonus of being in the level is that we also get a moment of high attention to show the level to the player and introduce the level to the player before letting them off the hook. So we get to make sure the camera has kind of panned and seen the whole uh, level. They, the camera is very oriented on the path ahead. Um, the player is set up for success to so just kind of get in the game and start moving. Um, and then we started getting into the actual gameplay, the actual walking around. Um, even here, actually, um, it's easier to feel on the controller when you play this, but here um, you actually can't take your gun out. Uh, you're actually stuck to just walking. And again, that's because we wanted to keep this mood of mystery. Um, Keegan, the character, is still kind of like trying to get his bearings. We didn't want the player to just kind of start whipping out their gun and shooting stuff. Um, so we really only like, you walk forward. Um, we, and then what we do with the level designers is we actually find places in the level where we want the character to react to what's around them. Uh, so in this case, um, this one right here is a key one because this moment where the cutscene ends and I return to gameplay is also where we give the player their first objective, this little star that's on the right side of the screen that's actually an objective marker if you have pink gears. Um, we, want the object we want the player to keep their attention on that objective mark because that's their gameplay goal the gameplay goal is always kind of the chief here even beyond story but what we do as the storytellers is make sure that there's context given to that goal so when the gameplay team triggers hey there's a goal here the narrative team triggers oh, okay keegan here's a beacon signal it could be the others i want to go there and find my i won't say friends they're not friends yet but i will find my uh my squad, <laughs> um, and that's the context I have over the um, gameplay. Could you miss that? It's fine if you do. Um, you know, you still have all the UI to tell you what to do, but it's the narrative kind of serves as a layer of why you're doing it. Why is your character doing it? Um, so I like to kind of present these on a scale of agency, just to kind of recap them. So again, cutscenes, they're really on that no agency, uh, really, you know, can't really do anything but watch, focus on the story versus scripted dialogue kind of lives on this axis between um, high agency and low agency. And our example of the uh, beacon is a high priority dialogue because it's explaining a gameplay objective. Again, gameplay objectives tend to be the king here. Um, so we keep control limited, we keep us more focused, and we put it more on that kind of low agency spectrum so we can ensure that there is high attention on that dialogue line. All right, 
So now we'll get into more, that was very much scripted dialogue to the service of game design. Uh, this next video is actually gonna be more about the, um, you know, the more of the story stuff, getting, getting dialogue in there to tell the story. So um, let's start video two. And again, there's a notation on the uh, bottom right. Uh, again, it goes by super fast, apologies, but uh, try to try to catch what's going on there. Um, and if not, I'll explain it after. So, okay, Josh, number two. Look down there. These ruins. I've seen something like them before. My grandmother left the Galandi Islands when she was young. But the photos are from this place. Hell of a way to reconnect with the roots. Was a, a section basically uh if anyone's interested in the story <laughs> I hope you are um spoiler keegan or the other whoever you're playing as does find the rest of their squad they start to explore the jungle further together and not soon after their reunion they actually stumble upon these ruins um the ruins come into play a lot later uh in the mission uh but this is really kind of just a foreshadowing of hey you know people either live here or used to live here um and we're actually getting into one of the characters' pasts, which is that her family actually is from this this part of Sarah uh, that we have never explored before. Sarah's gears is Earth, so you don't know. <laughs> so, oh, so um, yeah, so what's going on here? So obviously there was scripted speech. We triggered a Keegan saying, look down there, uh, just as we knew that when the player would walk here, their, their camera would probably be oriented in a way they could see these ruins and, you know, our lighting team as always is fantastic and made sure that there was a nice red pop to draw your eye there. Um, really making sure, oh, my font, <laughs> really making sure that the environmental storytelling here, those props are visible to the player. The player is very likely to look at them. Um, and this is story details. And the reason, the, the, the uh, distinction I want to make here is that these are all important things to know for the story. That's why we make sure it's very easy to see the prop here, the dialogue. But if the player doesn't know these, they can still play the game. If they miss these entirely, we can't really check if a player looks at something and comprehends it. Obviously, we can do ray chasing text and say, oh, well, they were pointed at it, so that should be fine. But we can't test their comprehension of what they're seeing. Uh, we can only put it out there and hope you know, do our best to make it clear and hope for the best. Um, so these are high priority story details, but they still kind of fall below that threshold of like, well, the player can still play the game without these, um, but they're there for people who want to know about the story. Uh, and then later on, um, getting that we're, you're gonna notice we're gonna get into more and more story detail. So uh, the previous uh, point about, here's some ruins, my, this character saying my family's from here, those ruins look at my grandma's photos. Um, that's something that comes up in the main storyline. Now we're getting into the stuff that goes, starts to get into more of the secondary plot lines, not as important stuff, more of stuff for those detail-oriented people. So here, and I actually used to miss this a lot when we were debugging this level, but here is actually wreckage from the plane that you were in. Uh, the plane has crashed. Uh, this is like a kind of a dismembered robot body that was in there. Um, the player can just speed right by this, and many of them do. Um, but if they're looking, if they really want to see those details, we reward that player and say, hey, you found a cool detail. And on this one specifically, uh, we actually added a, what we call collectibles, which are these. Oh, sorry. That was a very real storytelling. If you, you guys know that. <laughs> uh, we call these collectibles. So these are, um, you see this mechanic. Uh, I think I, I simplified this to just kind of story menus as a very general broad strokes definition of these. You see these manifest as, um, I know Outer Worlds has like computer terminals. Um, you know, you get like this famous with this, the Skyrim books, this, these exhaustive tomes of uh, crunchy story lore that people love to dig into. Um, this is kind of our version of that. It's just an image. And then um, a cool thing we did in Hivebusters was actually have different characters talk about the collectibles. So this collectible's uh, very important to one of our characters named Lonnie, the woman who was in the plane earlier. And so she gets to, uh, from her perspective, write about what this photo means from her. Um, she's very happy that it survived the plane crash. Um, 
this is all like obviously very little none of this is important for comprehending the plot this is pure world fluff this is pure um you know this is for the lore uh the people who want to dig in the lore is for people who read the wiki um this is for them so a player who isn't story oriented or is not story motivated they can skip that. This is that's totally fine. They can continue playing the game, but those lore motivated folks have this to kind of chew on, have fun with, um, think their own theories, make their own connections with. So just to put these new uh, these new techniques on our kind of little timeline. Um, yeah, all of that was a little. Like, there obviously was a lot more control, um, and so the attention was split. But we're okay with that because we registered this as a lower priority from a gameplay perspective. And I should clarify that um, that's a gameplay. Uh, priority, <laughs> very specifically. Um, oh. And then our our environmental storytelling is even less, even even less attention can be uh, guaranteed. Even more agency is given because we don't even know if you're comprehending what you're seeing. We all we can do is point the camera at it. Um, same as story menus, we can show you the menu. We can't tell if you read it. We can't tell what you comprehended from it. That's not something we can test quantifiably as game designers. But something we can give you. We hope you make YouTube theory videos about it later. Uh, it's something for people to chew in and have fun with. Uh, so the last video I'll share from Hive Busters. Um, now we're gonna get into unscripted dialogue. So everything you saw before that is hand placed by a designer or designers working. Uh, we work in Unreal, Unreal Four. Um, they are hand placing dialogue calls, cutscene calls, animation calls in the in the blueprint. This system I'm about to show you is my my personal favorite, which is um, more code driven. So what we do here is that a engineer will uh, send a ping to our dialogue system and say, hey, someone's attacking or someone just got killed or someone is ready to use their ultimate power. They're, they're charged up. And then what the narrative designers do is we actually build a more, a huge kind of like database of lines that might be valid for that situation. Uh, so basically, if Keegan kills a um, a swarm drone, we have a bucket of lines that are Keegan kills a swarm drone, and these are all the things he could say. And the system takes care of randomizing that, making sure that doesn't repeat too much, uh, picking different lines. So, all right, again, captions at the bottom right. Try to follow along and not just listen and have fun. Uh, Josh, can you start number three, please? Super fun. Um, definitely recommend uh, checking out playing this. It's my, it's way more fun to play than watch. I will say because it's designed that way. It's designed to be interacted with. It's not really designed to be a movie, but such as such as the medium. Uh, so what we saw there again, like I said, these are triggered off of commands that we just kind of feed a we feed a parser. The parser says, oh, "Okay, sounds like someone killed somebody. Here's the line for that." Um, they're used for gameplay actions, obviously. They live right alongside the code level of our gameplay actions. The same area where we're gonna detect, did that guy die? That did that guy die call is gonna say, hey, a guy did die and I need a dialogue event for that, thank you. Um, so we tend to actually put these in code, uh, honestly, just cause it's a little more efficient. Um, blueprint can drop frames, we can lose stuff. So we, we like to put it in code. Um, not to say you can't put them in blueprint, but uh, when things get this frenetic, uh, we do like to keep it as efficient as possible. Um, so these two actually live on a higher enough priority uh, schedule, just like the other lines we talked about. So to go back to our lovely graph, um, we had 
obviously a lot of dialogue happening, but I'd like to isolate kind of three specific event calls that we had there. Um, one was a new goal. Uh, that there are new enemies coming. There's snipers on the ridge. We got to get rid of them. That was actually scripted dialogue because we had to make sure that that played no matter what, no matter if the players run around shooting stuff, reloading, whatever they're doing, we're actually going to suppress any of that dialogue and make sure that we're scripting on top of that. There's a new goal. There's new enemies. Player, you got to pay attention. There's a new thing for you to do. That's why it's gameplay critical. Therefore, it's high priority. Um, we need to make sure it's very easily heard. Um, and then we had feedback. We had feedback to like, I killed a guy. Um, and that, uh, that I kind of label as a main item. So that's not critical to the player understanding they killed a guy. There's a lot of other feedback that lets you know that you killed a guy. Um, but this is um, this is a reward. You know, this is this is you celebrating alongside your character and say like, I killed a guy. And Keegan's like, I killed a guy. We killed a guy. Um, it feels good, and um, we want to have that that immediate feedback for the player so that they feel like the game is listening, the game is responding what they do matters, um, that their agency is rewarded. That's actually another another psychological concept of uh, uh, effect on the world. Uh, and then uh, we had feedback. Uh, so uh, I wrote redundant here. Um, and the specific example I want to call out is um, in Gears of War, we have ultimate abilities, um, where there are special powers that a anyone in your uh, team can use. Um, and they, they exist on a, on a meter. So once you expend your energy or your ultimate, you have to wait a little bit for that to that meter to refill and you would be able to use it again. Um, so we have a, uh, a dialogue line that can fire that tells you it's ready. But we also have a lot of information already on screen, like the UI for the ultimate that tells you that. Um, this isn't super important here. So hypothetically, if I kill the guy the same time my ultimate meter came up, kill the guy line is going to play. Uh, we're going to choose that line as the higher party line because we, we've deemed it more important in our system to play. The player can always check their UI and say, ah, OK, also my open power is ready. Great. So just to recap those really quickly, again, these kind of exist on this. Uh, yeah, we talked about already about how they exist on this agency scale. Um, this is really this. The font gets a little screwed up, sorry. But um, <laughs> this is really the also the gameplay priority that our, uh, our dialogue tools exist on. So again, critical story points, things critical story go to these cutscenes. Gameplay goals are also right up there. They are very high priority. Um, I'd say even sometimes a higher priority than the story, frankly. Um, they give the player their call to action. Gameplay feedback is right under that, making sure that the gameplay feels good, that the that characters feel real, that they feel like they're responding. Um, and then we get story world building. And I know that breaks a lot of, it breaks my heart to see that too on the bottom, but that's kind of the reality of games. Um, not everyone plays games for the story, so it's important to Keep it, uh, keep it accessible, but uh, not make it critical. Uh, let it, like, give it space, but not shoving people's faces if they don't want to see it. It's there for the people who want to look for it. Uh, okay, I want to make sure we leave time for Q and A, but I want to go really quickly, um, just because I did work at Telltale. I care a lot about story as gameplay. I do want to go into two more tools that you see when a game decides to be story driven, when it decides truly to say, "Hey, player, you're not shooting guns, you're not solving puzzles." Your goal right now is to role play, to be part of our story, and we're going to give you tools to be a part of that story. This is what these mechanics are about. And again, with the caveat of these might be different terms in different places, but um, what I want to talk about are dialogue options. This is, I think, I think Mass Effect maybe is very popular as well as Telltale, um, where you get to pick the story, and then QTEs, which we'll get into QTEs. I think everyone has opinions about QTEs. <laughs> um, but dialogue options. Um, if you're working on a game with dialogue options, uh, you have a lot of work cut out for you as an error designer. This is going to be a lot of your job <laughs> is figuring out where these go in the story um, and what these little bubbles say. And what we do to design that as error designers is we usually create rails. Rails are the uh, different tracks, rails, tracks, the tracks of role playing that we're going to allow the uh, player to Right, walk down. Simple as into this is everyone's played Mass Effect, Renegade, Paragon. You can be good or bad. That's those are rails. Those those are the choices you can make. Um, in Telltale games, we tend to be a little more focused with our rails. We're really kind of building different versions of the character. So in, in this game, The Wolf Among Us, you're playing as the big bad wolf, who's also a cop. Long story, maybe just play it. Um, but you have four rails. One rail is the good cop. 
One rail is the more neutral, kind of straightforward detective. A third rail is the big bad wolf, the jerk. Um, you're going to be mean on this rail. And then obligatory fourth choice, which frankly just exists because if, the t if there's a dialogue timer, if the timer runs out, the game has to do something. <laughs> so you don't say anything. Um, that's dialogue options. And then I'll touch on QT events. I believe these are actually falling out of fashion. Um, this is when, you know, it's really just a cutscene, but it's interactive. Uh, the player is ask is really just click a button when you see it on screen. Um, they're very expensive because uh, you're basically making a cutscene, but then you are adding in things like idle loops while you wait for the player to interact. Uh, you're adding in fail states if the player fails to interact. Um, we totally didn't build fail states for some, walk, some Wolf Among Us cutscenes because they were too expensive. So if you fail, it just keeps going. Um, they are very expensive. I don't see them a lot. I think Uncharted 4 was the last time I really saw one in earnest and Ghost of Tsushima might have had some, but they're uh, they're kind of falling out of favor, but I put them here because you still see them. People still make them. Uh, if you want a more cinematic look to your game, they were there. there. And again, just to wrap those up, put them on our graph. Uh, QT is really just nestled right there next to cutscenes really just adding like a little bit of attention there because you have to look at the buttons on the um, on the on the screen that are prompted. And then dialogue choices actually gets kind of a special area. It's not really on this graph because it's switching the context of the game from being story helping gameplay to story is now the gameplay. We have the full attention of the player. The player has agency over the story. It's a different kind of thing. So it doesn't really quite fit on our spectrum here, but uh, Games will choose to use things like dialogue options when they want to switch the player into that mode of thinking. Um, the Witcher does this really well. If you've played The Witcher, they have a great, um, lots of lots of combat um, that I'm very bad at, but um, lots of combat, and then they'll put you in a story mode where now you have agency over the story via dialogue options. Um, again, really quick, um, I just want to go over. So <laughs> before we get into Q and A, the big caveat in narrative design is there aren't a lot of us in the industry. And part of that is because, well, our narrative teams tend to be very small. You really only need um, a few, a handful of narrative folks among others to um, to handle your dialogue in the games. Um, but that's not to say story isn't in the hands of anybody besides narrative. Um, in fact, what I really like about my team right now is that a lot of people in other departments contribute to the story just as much as I do. So um, I just wanted to show a, couple, a handful of those uh, those departments that also contribute to story. Um, I think anyone in any of these in these uh, disciplines also gets to do a lot of story work, gets to talk about story a lot as part of their job. Um, it's really, um, you know, there's no, <laughs> don't feel like you need to have the narrative designer title to be part of a game story. Um, there's many other ways to be part of a game story depending on the team that you're on. Um, yeah, so just some final remarks. Um, Remember that narrative designers are skilled in story development and game design. If you want to be one, study both. Uh, our Most of our job is choosing the right storytelling tools. And a lot of that is weighing player agency and attention against the priority of the story, the priority of the game goals. Um, and it is not something you do in a vacuum. It is uh, co collaboration is the key here. You have to be able to collaborate with their teams. You have to be able to speak their language. Uh, you got to study up, even if you don't do gameplay design, you should be well versed and have to talk about game design to interact with your coworkers. Um, and that's that. Um, open for questions. Again, I'm always available on Twitter. You can also email me if you have any more questions that you didn't get to ask in this presentation or just want to tweet. I love tweeting. Uh, so yeah, we'll open the floor to questions, Great. OK. Let me see here. Am I there? Yes. We've got some great student questions. First, we have a great question from Julian Camaraza. Uh, hi, Julian. Uh, my question is obviously so the green part, not part of the factory but I think it's really nice. Uh, Versus like hive clusters have completely different dialogue styles and thematic needs. I was wondering what the process is like for getting in the headspace to write for you know completely different games and make sure that the dialogue still matches the overall brand. Yeah. So uh, 
That's a great question. Actually, do we have time to show video number four? Because I actually have a clip from South Park I could show and then we can talk over how some of that dialogue worked. Um, I believe this is annotated on the file name, Josh, if you see that. Four A or four, four A or four B. One says annotated, I think. Uh, <laughs> one says no markup, and oh. the other one doesn't have anything. Okay, the one with nothing. Okay. That's the one yep. I want. I've got it ready. <laughs> Making a big mistake messing with human friends. I'll have you in stitches. Now you see me? Wait, Kurt, what a surprise. I'm taking a blood sample now. Dude, dial it back. <laughs> That's some nasty shit, dude. Think about what you're doing, okay? Ever get the feeling life is punishing you for being a dick, sweet? Storm brewing! Oh. Lame! No, you're lame! You're like the lamest lame of all time! That was lame, too. Yeah, so, um, you see there, um, I know, again, everything goes by very fast, but, uh, similar to, actually, the, the last Gears video I showed where dialogue's being driven by events, that's actually how almost all of South Park was written. Um, in fact, we really only had cutscenes, which were produced with our partners down at South Park Studios. And then the rest of us was kind of handed to us and we had to just kind of figure out how to, <laughs> how to put it in. Um, and the reason we took a systemic approach is actually because it's more flexible. Um, you know, the way that uh, South Park tends to work is they kind of have a lot of ideas. We kind of just throw it in the game, see if it works, see if it's funny, you know, it's comedy. So we have to kind of test if it works and be very flexible. And so what the systemic approach allows us to do is kind of just try stuff really quickly. Um, all the dialogue you saw there um, could trigger in other combats. Um, it's actually very possible that you'll hear that same argument between Tweet and Craig in a different combat. Um, it just happened to be in this video and that one. And the mindset, that, this mindset shift there is really thinking in that kind of generic sense. Um, and why that really works for something like South Park is because the characters are so strong. It doesn't really matter where they are. Their interaction is going to be, you know, fairly character centric. They're gonna they're gonna have their own relationships with each other that they're playing off of their own jokes to tell. So um, that's the mind shift. Whereas um, in Gears of War, we tend to do a lot more. Uh, we call it bespoke, very specific dialogue. So you have characters reacting to things in the level, very specific items, having very linear. Um, a, B, C plot development uh, in those in those uh, more scripted dialogues. Um, so it's really thinking more like a movie, whereas South Park was kind of like kind of like doing uh, like little pods of fan fiction <laughs> here and there that then you kind of trigger off and have play. So yeah. Oh, yeah. uh, that is. Oh. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it answers question. Uh, that Thank wasn't you. me. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Julian, about that. Next, we have a great question from Jax Taylor. <laughs> uh, how's it going? Uh, I'm Jax Taylor. Uh, I keep getting UX major. Um, working on so many Telltale games, you seem to have a fantastic grasp on like the ins and outs of player choice, whether they're true or false choices. You kind of just give out to them just in case. Uh, do you ever find yourself being more devious in writing player choices? And routes, or is it the same level of deviousness that you have in your normal story writing where the player follows a mostly predetermined path? Yeah, so that actually, so to be frank with you, they, um, choice-based choice -based games tend to follow a very decided path. Um, and I know Mass Effect 3 got really called out for that one. <laughs> but uh, a lot of that happens because of how we plan these games. Um, you know, we don't think too, like, basically when we plan a season of a Telltale game, we plan the season like we would a season of TV. There's episodes one, two, three, four, five. Um, you know, two and four kind of end up being like meh because they're interstitial, and then you have like the really real like intro twist yeah. and uh, and conclusion episodes. Um, we tend to get two and four to the new guys. That's just how it works. <laughs> but yeah, so we plan it like that, and so that flow is fairly determined. We kind of know where the characters are going to go. Okay. And then our job is to decide. Okay, what's the little choices in between? that we can give the player um, that make them feel like they're part of that journey. Um, a really good example, if people don't mind me spoiling Walking Dead season one, 
I'm sorry, um, but a very good example is actually, we know at the end of season one, the main character, Lee, had to die. We knew that was how we wanted to end the season, he's going to die. The choice we gave the player was, does Clementine Mercy kill him? Does she take it upon herself to kill him? Or does she walk away and kind of let nature take its course? And that, um, you know, story-wise, plot-wise, that doesn't change anything. But character-wise, again, hooking on character and hooking mm -hmm. in the player's attention to character to get that choice feeling good, that's what we hook into. And that's what we make sure people can come away and say, like, oh, I, as Clementine, couldn't kill him. Or I, as Clementine, decided killing him was the right thing to do. Um, it's letting them really embody that character and embody that role-playing experience. Even though they're just giving them two choices, even though the result plot side is the same, the impact is different. It's different, yeah, okay. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate yeah, it. Of course, thank you. Next question is from the chat. Jordan asks, are there any specific tips for handling narratives with very little or no dialogue? Oh, yeah. Um, this is actually uh, very pertinent to some of my work right now that I can't talk about. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, so when I uh, talked about collaboration earlier with your teams, um, that really is where that becomes paramount because on a normal dialogue game, my tool, my contribution is dialogue. I write scripts, I give scripts to people, I write lore drops, I write, I, you know, I, I contribute an actual piece of content to the game, which is text. But I'm not contributing that text that goes in the game. My contributions has to become direction. And that's when story direction as a skill becomes a lot more important because um, I'm no longer kind of putting my dialogue in as you would with other linear media. I'm now kind of saying, well, here's the world. Here's the facts of the world. Here's how these characters work and, and kind of what motivates them. I'm giving that to the artists, the animators, um, the audio team, the cinematics team to execute on that. So it's like, I don't get to execute on my own direction in those cases. I have to kind of hand off that direction to a team to execute on. And so the narrative designer job really becomes more of a, a story planner um, and really more of a, you know, someone who's helping kind of keep things cohesive and review but we're not actually kind of contributing as deeply. So our team might be a lot smaller. Um, you know, we won't need five writers on that kind of a team, um, but we might actually need more storyboard artists. We might need to hire people who are really good at biz dev who can think narratively while doing visual uh, visual development. So yeah, great question. It definitely changes the makeup of your team. Let's see, Nico Smoke wants to know how much of the tech you actually get to be involved in making as a narrative designer. So I'm pushy and I get to be involved in it a lot. I actually designed, um, when I came on to South Park Fractured But Whole, it's actually built in the same engine as The Division. And it did not have the narrative system that we needed to build South Park to make a, a comedy game with quick, fast um, dialogue flying around all the time, contextualized dialogue. So I actually designed that system. It's based very heavily on the Left 4 Dead system, credit where credit's due. <laughs> but uh, I kind of looked at Left 4 Dead and said, how do I port this into Snowdrop, the Ubisoft engine? And I got to work directly with engineer. We worked basically for the whole development project on building that tool. Um, I find it's actually a big gap, to be frank with you guys, a big gap in the industry right now that we have technically minded narrative designers. I think if you are able to cultivate both sides of that, both sides of you to be technical, but also story focused, understand what your story needs to be told on a technical level, that's a great angle to come in the industry with because that's, um, you know, we get a lot of Hollywood people in narrative. We get a lot of story people. We get a lot of TV people who don't necessarily know how games work. And that's really a struggle <laughs> with, a, with this kind of facet of the industry. So I'd say it's rare, but it's definitely encouraged. It's definitely awesome if you can do both. As a follow-up to that, do you get to be involved in some of the environment design since environmental storytelling is part of narrative design? Absolutely. Yeah. I work, uh, especially on Gears of War where our, we have a great, our, our team is so strong um, and our level design team is so strong. Uh, they really are carrying a lot of the story on their backs. You know, we can put dialogue in levels here and there, but you get so much when you look at a big jungle, you look at ruins and you go, wow. Um, so, I'd say that's a collaboration again, like, um, you know, we try not to dictate, like they gotta go to a ruin right here. Um, it's really more about the level designer will make a level that feels good, feels fun. And then narrative will opportunistically find places where it's like, hey, 
if you can get the camera to like just work just this way, can we put a really important prop there to maybe uh, foreshadow this this ruin plot line? So yeah. Okay. Sequoia asks. I know you've already kind of answered this, but there are many players that only care for the combat portion of gaming and often miss or ignore things because they don't care for story. What are some ways, either through environmental storytelling or interactive storytelling, to get those type of players to take an interest? Yeah, so um, I actually, again, I'll bring up The Witcher because I think The Witcher does a really good job with this where um, they... They honestly keep story and combat fairly separate. Um, you are, when it's gameplay time, it's gameplay time. You're walking around, you're fighting guys, you're doing a thing. And then when it comes to missions, uh, when you start interacting with NPCs, that's when they really pull the narrative cord and they shift those mechanics away from those action-oriented mechanics and the mechanics become that choice-based dialogue. So that's why you see games actually swing between those two is because they're trying to take their core base that's doing action gameplay and saying, hey, your gameplay now, the, the actions you're doing now are gonna be actually reading and interacting. Um, and so that, so honestly, that's the way to kind of, to reel that in is to say, no, your gameplay is now story. Um, that's really the way to do it. Um, otherwise, honestly, our approach in Gears of War is we let them just be action oriented. If they miss the story, that's fine. Um, it's cool to just wanna shoot some grubs. Like, <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. Daniel Grubbs, a video game development sophomore, asks, when YouTube videos are made that present theories about a game that has been made, is that a good source for continuing the story as it pertains to future games, or would you rather stick to a pre-designed story you and your team have made for the game or series? That is a great question, and I'd actually like to preface that with Please, 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 when you look at YouTube theory crafting, please take it with a grain of salt. Um, I see, I even on my own team, I combat misinformation with how story is developed and built um, because people watch YouTube videos and get really into theory crafting. But the truth it is, it's a lot of armchair criticism and a lot of like assumptions. Um, so definitely take everything you see there with a grain of salt. On the story development side, um, I will say we do take those actually into account. Um, I know on Gears of War, we're very, um, we always have an eye on the Reddit threads as well as um, YouTube's and other areas where our community interacts. Um, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. And especially um, the coalition is actually part of Microsoft. Uh, so we get access to a lot of really amazing consumer analysis tools. So um, especially when you, if you find yourself being a narrative designer at a larger company, they're gonna wanna use those tools to really zero in on what people want um, quantifiably. Um, YouTube guy is a great source of like qualitative information. That's one person's opinion, but um, it's really only one part of a very large, um, you know, marketing machine <laughs> that really tells us this is what people want to see. They love seeing, um, you know, they love seeing Master Chief, keep Master Chief in the game. Don't, don't reboot it with no Master Chief. If we lose Master Chief, we lose Halo for, for as an example. Um, we, yeah, it's, Games research and user research has really evolved. Um, I'd even say, because back when I was a Telltale, yeah, we would just go on the forums and go, oh, people don't want that guy to die. Maybe we shouldn't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> but nowadays, now that we have more intelligence, more business intelligence, we're able to hook up with people like Microsoft, you know, EA, Ubisoft, all have these arms of their companies now that get real user research in the way Hollywood would get user research in. We utilize that a lot more. But yeah, good question. <laughs> Someone's a business business minded person in there. <laughs> Jolie, thank you so much for your time and a fantastic presentation. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for this session. Uh, don't go anywhere. Up next is a presentation from alumnus Jeff White, a visual effects supervisor and creative director at Industrial Light and Magic. Tonight at 6 p.m., Tune into the Spotlight Award presentation with the incomparable Will Wheaton. Enjoy the festival, everyone.